Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Ashim Bembe's Necropolitics, which is a pretty cool essay and one that I enjoy quite a bit. But before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way that makes them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? They might get a kick out of it. And I'd love to hear from you. So comment. Uh, sh share and anything like that would help me out a lot if you want to help me out via uh, patreon or paypal that is monetarily you can do that uh, as well but obviously no pressure if you found this on youtube you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads or if you found this in podcast form you're going to be able to find me on youtube where i sometimes release videos which is obviously uh which can be fun so yeah uh those are the options out there don't want to waste any more of your time Let's talk about Ashim Bembe's necropolitics. Now, I just want to begin by saying that I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, I looked up a number of interviews and talks that he gave, and that was how he was introduced. I've also heard it uh, pronounced with an English, um, I guess, an English approach being Ashil Bembe's, which is obviously uh, probably not correct. Uh, but anyways, I, I take pronunciation quite seriously, and if anyone can correct me on how to properly pronounce his name if I have pronounced it wrong. I would love to hear about it if you're willing to put in that effort. So he begins his text by meditating, or I guess thinking about the nature of sovereignty. And that is in the history of philosophy, sovereignty has been thought to have a power to choose who gets to live and who may die. So to be the sovereign is to be somebody who has this capacity to choose. Now, throughout the course of this essay, Mbembe is going to make a lot of references or many references to a number of different thinkers. So some of them include, and the biggest ones that he discusses are uh, Foucault and Foucault's idea of biopolitics. Um, we have a Gombin's idea of the state of exception, and we have some of the biggest ones. We have Wiseman's, A.L. Wiseman's approach to uh, incorporating Deleuze and Guattari's thought to think about the uh, continued occupation of Palestinian territory by Israel. Now, I've covered each of those thinkers on this channel, so you can go and check out any one of those episodes, be they the ones I've done on biopolitics, the ones I've done on um, Homo Saker by Agamben, in which I would discuss the state of exception a little bit, I believe I did. And I've also covered a text on that A.L. Wiseman uh, does called Lethal Theory. And that would give you a pretty good back drop to what's going on in this text, but it's not totally necessary. So I'm going to give you, uh, I think what, you know, you'll need to get by in order to understand what's going on in this text. But if you want more, you can go and check those out. But what Mbembe is trying to do here is to go beyond Foucault's notion of biopolitics. And to put it quite simply, biopolitics for Foucault is the exertion of a certain kind of force that isn't intent upon killing people or demonstrating one's strength, that is a sovereign, or disciplinary apparatuses in the act of punishing people with pain or death. Rather, a type of control emerges at some point for Foucault, perhaps in the 18th, 19th centuries, uh, or the, even the 20th century, when a focus on life becomes the end goal of power, where power becomes not um, the act of subtracting life, but of adding to life, of creating mechanisms that can then control populations while, in many cases, growing them. Now, in his formulation, Foucault does obviously recognize that there are still mechanisms that put people to death. This is very clear in, in so many nations. Of course, obvious examples would be the continued use of the death penalty or other forms of uh, killing that happen by uh, systematically by governments, uh, be they in war situations or against their own populations or what have you. Foucault obviously recognizes this, but Mbembe is very clear that that analysis or the analysis of the capacity to still kill within this so-called biopolitical framework gets, um, I guess, it, it gets eclipsed by the possibility of power being exerted over life, not over death. So what Mbembe is doing here is opening up a discourse into the continued use of power to, uh, to, to kill, to put people to death, to choose who can live and who can die. 
Now, to sort of ground his approach to necropolitics, Mbembe asks a number of questions, and some of them include, who is the subject of this right? That is the right to choose who gets to live and who gets to die. How is this right to kill exercised? What does this practice tell us about the person put to death? So here he's opening up a giant, or giant, a big discussion about the very nature of the capacity to kill on behalf of people in power or, or by the hands of people in power, perhaps not directly, but through various institutions and, and so on. Now to think about this a little bit more uh, concretely, he, he turns to the work of Agamben, specifically Agamben's thought of the state of exception. Now to put it really simply, the state of exception for Agamben is a state in which laws or is maybe a moment within a nation or within um, a kind of judicial setting in which laws can be suspended in order to exert control. So for example, uh, following I, th I think this, this, this example would work, but following Pearl ha Harbor in the United States, the rights of Japanese Americans were taken away so that they could be put in internment camps with, with no real reason. So in that case, the law of the, or the rights of the people were suspended so that control could be better exerted over them as, as people. So the state of exception, again, this is putting it quite simply, is a moment in which laws are suspended to enact more stringent laws, which are kind of are, are a way to circumvent uh, regular channels, be they through uh, the court systems or the justice system or anything like that, instead to exert pure control over people. Now for Agamben, he thinks about as well how sovereignty and how the use of control can be used to bring bodies and to bring people down to what he calls bare life. And what this is, is just bringing people, stripping them of all identity and making them just uh, flesh and bone, essentially, turning them into cattle. So one of the examples that Agamben gives is thinking about this in terms of the Holocaust, which is a site in which people were reduced to uh, just, just life. That's all they had. Their identities were taken from them and they were just um, kind of living beings that would, were then kind of ripe for control and for extermination. So Mbembe doesn't want to discount that at all. He wants to take that idea and expand it and look at as well the history of the possibility of this kind of control which he traces to modernity quite generally and how these very po these mechanisms, these possibilities of necropower, the exertion of a certain capacity to choose who gets to live and who gets to die, mostly who gets to die, can be found in modernity, in the very roots of modernity. So when we think about sovereignty here and this person who has or people who have the capacity to choose uh, make these kinds of decisions, Mbembe is not necessarily going after the possibility of sovereignty or sovereignty as uh, someone's struggle for autonomy because autonomy is quite important but he's instead interested in sovereignty as it is embraced by those who institute the generalized instrumentalization of human existence and the material destruction of human bodies and populations. So there must be kind of uh, accompanying this sovereignty, an entire mechanism that can be deployed against people. So just an individual person seeking their own way in life doesn't have the capacity to exert this kind of force. Instead, or what is required is an entire mechanism that can put that force into operation. And of course, the way that this can best work out is if there is an, a social system that has a long history uh, that has been fermenting for a very long time in or that can uh, kind of kind of deliver on the promise of instrumentalizing this force to be exerted against other people. Now, consideration here of the role of reason in this formula is quite useful. Uh, and we might think here of Adorno, specifically the argument that Adorno and Horkheimer make in the dialectic of enlightenment when they criticize Kant or see, or they maybe point to the ways that Kant's project opens up possible lines of sovereignty and control, fascism. So they are very uh, much concerned with that. But here, Mbembe doesn't want to necessarily only appeal to this abstract conception of reason to think about the emergence of these possibilities, but rather the more tangible forms of life and death and how they figure into this paradigm.
So to do this, he turns to Hegel, specifically the Hegel of the phenomenology of spirit, who thinks about death as being, or people's confronting death, as a, as a way by which they can open themselves up to the incessant movement of history. That is, for Hegel, to be turned to one's own possibility of death is to open up the potential for freedom to some extent. And so to put one's death into the equation, to put up one's death as a site of possibility, is a way by which to open oneself up to infinite possibility. So in Membe's words here, politics is therefore death that lives a human life. Now by way of a contrast to Hegel's approach that Membe invokes, he turns to the work of Bataille, George, uh, George Bataille. And I don't know a whole lot about uh, Bataille, and I, I read a fair amount to kind of prepare to discuss about this, but there could be Bataillians out there who think uh, that I might mischaracterize some of this. Um, and I'd love to hear about it. If there's anything I'm about to screw up about Bataille, please let me know. But for Mbembe, uh, Bataille believes that death signals a kind of capacity for or a moment of proliferation. So in Bataille, there is almost the necessity to drive things towards equilibrium, where if there's too much excess, some needs to be taken out in order for the system to uh, organize itself coherently, which opens up a number of problematic avenues that I'm not going to go into now, but this is what he gives us. So in uh, Mbembe's words, he says that the most luxurious form of life that is uh, in the form of this proliferation opens up this capacity for the most luxurious form of life or this possibility. So death then masks what he calls, or marks, I should say, what he calls an anti-economy, a form of absolute expenditure. Whereas for Hegel, as, as I've already mentioned, death signals uh, a movement towards absolute knowledge. Now, for Bataille, it seems as though, as Membe is reading it, death or the exertion of, the, of death to be able to choose who lives and dies is a, certain, is a sign of sovereignty, but to uh, do that is almost only for one's own benefit to exert this kind of control, whereas for Hegel, it has possibility to be turned on to this greater, um, more abstract thing, being absolute knowledge or absolute spirit or, or what have you. Now, after establishing these approaches, that, of, that is of Bataille and uh, Hegel, he turns to Foucault to think of biopower in terms of the state of exception that I've already mentioned, and also the state of siege. And the state of siege comes out of the work of, of Carl Schmitt, who I've actually never done on this channel. Um, but the state of siege, as far as I understand it, because it's kind of a, I don't know how much Schmitt really builds on that idea, but it's a moment in which a state feels themselves to be under attack and they then can uh, turn around and attack who they perceive to be threatening them. And we see this again and again against um, certain uh, Muslim countries by the United States, for example, throughout the past 30, 40, 50 years. Now, these terms describe that is the state of exception and the state of siege. They describe situations where extra legal measures are deployed against a perceived threat. So it opens up, if a, if a country feels itself to be under threat, it will suspend its laws, perhaps, it, or get rid of some of the laws, you know, be quite selective to circumvent proper channels of conduct. So, for example, following 9-11, not getting Congress's approval to go uh, to war with Iraq, for example. Now, for Foucault, biopower births racism, and racism figures into Foucault's project here uh, in a way that I don't, I don't totally agree with, but what Foucault gives us in terms of biopower and biopolitics is that Racism is the product of certain state formations that have embraced this notion of biopolitics that can divide people in terms of populations, in terms of, I guess, almost their own species, in terms of races, and they use that logic to then better control certain populations by allowing some to flourish and some not to. Now, racism from Bembe in this framework is a technology and it is a technology that is deployed to allow the state to exercise its thirst for death, its desire to keep maintaining its control in the kind of classical form of just exerting death, not just proliferating life or expanding life to control populations. So we saw this on full display in Nazi Germany against the Jewish people, against Roma people, against black people, all throughout Nazi Germany, including others, who deployed this technology of racism alongside many new technologies of 
industrialization of certain logics of computation and classification and organizing that facilitated and that really occasioned the possibility for uh, the Nazi concentration camps to crystallize and for millions of people to be relocated with it with seemingly little resistance. Now, I don't mean resistance from the Jewish people. I mean resistance in a logistical sense. Like these things were able to be conducted quite smoothly with the help of IBM as just one um, one source of, of aid. And I hope I don't get sued, but in any case, that's they were one of the factors that helped Nazi Germany along. So this is the meeting place, and Foucault builds upon this idea as well. This is one example of the meeting of reason and terror, where reason and terror come together to enact some of the greatest horrors to ever happen. And for example, and we see this play out in many different political arenas. For example, Membe points to Marxism as being um, another kind of terroristic project that prides itself on the reasonable deconstruction of capitalism's contradictions. So it takes on this um, kind of persona of being a reasonable alternative to capitalism, but it engages in its project in a kind of terroristic fashion. Now, I don't know what Mbembe's actual uh, views of Marxism is, if he's just criticizing its use by certain people, but in any case, this is what he gives us. Now, talking about all this, it's hard not to discuss slavery as being an absolute example of uh, this kind of necro power being exerted, specifically exerted against people of color, mostly black people. And this is a kind of, for him, slavery marks a kind of death in life, the uh, becoming living dead of people. So they have their identities taken away, they have their homes taken away, they're put in a place that is not welcoming to them unless they are being not themselves, they're just being reduced to a kind of bare life, to a kind of animalistic state. And these are, uh, I guess, strategies deployed to make death or to render living people dead. So one of the other influences from Bembe here is Paul Gilroy, who I've just done a couple of episodes on his text, The Black Atlantic. And what Paul Gilroy does is he wants to, at least this is part of his project, is he wants to show that there, despite the horrors of slavery, obviously it is something that should never happen again. Uh, and the continued uh, effects of it all across the world, and the continued practices of it have to be ended immediately. But what Gilroy does is he says, there was still a lot of beauty that came out of it in terms of black cuisine in the United States, black cuisine, black music, black art, that are just examples of people, despite the immeasurable violence inflicted against them, were still able to produce what is to this day some of the best cuisine, art, music, poetry, literature. And it is in that that Paul Gilroy finds a great deal of meaning. And so what Membe does, taking from Paul Gilroy, is to nuance this discussion of the becoming dead of enslaved people to say that despite that, there was a kind of profound strength within these populations, within these groups, within these communities to challenge that, to oppose the necro power that was being exerted against them. And insofar as uh, slavery and colonization and Mbembe does not discount the violences that were inflicted as well against indigenous people, insofar as these events happened to coincide and were uh, happening alongside the emergence of this thing called modernity and the Enlightenment, which I guess came a little bit after, but in any case, we started to see the kernels of them forming at the same time. He says that these were, that is, colonization and slavery served as the kind of testing ground for what would then be the absolute instru instrumentalization of terror and rationality against entire populations, including uh, like what was seen in Rwanda, what was seen in Nazi Germany, and etc. And the reason that these were good places for these types of controls to be uh, practiced was because the colonies, in Bembe's words, the colonies are where the controls and guarantees of judicial order can be suspended because there are no laws, so to speak, uh, in those settings, and 
can therefore be more easily, when they have been established, can be more easily taken up. So it was much easier than to slaughter indigenous people en masse without feelings of guilt or, or animosity or anything. So colonial power then demarcates and divides. So not only does it inflict direct physical violence against um, indigenous people or against enslaved people, it also begins to separate those people from themselves. And we saw this play out, of course, in Rwanda, where Hutus um, and Tutsis were made to feel like they were different from one another because of colonization, because of classifying people based off of their physical appearance. And we also see this play out in the ways that Palestinian people are continually constructed as separate, as different, because, because they necessarily are, from the Israeli sovereign state. And it is by these kinds of modes of differentiation that certain people can be uh, targeted with violence. So it's here that he invokes the work of Al Wiseman, who discusses the ways that Palestinian territory is kind of chopped up and demarcated, and the ways that Israeli forces operate within these kind of chopped up zones. And he likens it to a rhizome, as um, he takes Wiseman takes from the work of Deleuze and Guattari, to describe the ways that the Israeli armies and the Israeli special forces go into Palestinian territories without following uh, conventional routes like roads or alleyways or anything. Instead, they break through walls and houses in order to create unpredictable routing paths to invade that territory. And this opens up for um, Membe the possibility or novel possibilities for destruction and invisible killing. Now, this is obviously in addition to the very clear overt killing that occurs with drone strikes or with bombs or with anything like that. And this speaks to a broader development in the state of, uh, of, of humanity, at least in the so-called uh, West or in the global North, where wars now are conducted entirely differently than they were in the past, where now they are they aren't like demonstrations of respect between rivals. They are instead um, demonstrations of domination. And we get this a lot in the work of Jean Baudrillard as well, who just <laughs> writes many of his texts are focused to the, um, are kind of uh, focus on this issue of wars becoming something of domination, not of not of um, respecting a uh, respecting duel between two nations or two uh, enemies. And he says that this, the kind of war that we see today, rather than it being a war on like a battlefield, for example, a kind of stationary war, he says that these new globalized wars are more reminiscent of the warfare strategy of the nomads, where here it is all about global mobility. And as well, we might, just to go back to that idea that Wiseman gives us of the Israeli forces using these rhizomatic patterns, breaking through walls, stuff like that, in order to invade Palestinian territory, it hardly corresponds to a classic war scenario of one army on one side, one army on the other, and they charge at one another uh, to inflict damage against them. And these strategies for Membe, these kind of necropolitical strategies, happen to also mirror the movements of late capitalism, where capitalism in its uh, globalized potential can always seek out new markets wherever it uh, whatever, wherever it wishes, wherever might, they might be able to extract the most surplus value, wherever they might be able to pay their workers less, they go there. And very much in the same way, we see these battles wage out, rage out uh, between people in a kind of spontaneous fashion. Now, in kind of a turn, he then meditates on the role or the position of a suicide bombings within this um, this paradigm as being a demonstration of kind of body to body warfare where and a lot of what he writes here feels like you know he's just putting his thoughts out on the table and i'm not entirely sure how it fits in with the with the rest of it i'm sure it does i just maybe i'm too uh dense to really grasp it but some of the observations that he makes is that in the case of a suicide bomb bomber there is someone who uh turns their own body into a weapon and so it is kind of an opportunity to oppose the logics of drone strikes, of instrumentalization that conducts violence at a distance. Now, this is in no way to lionize or romanticize uh, 
uh, these any of these acts. I mean, they're all reprehensible in, in every single way. But he says that in the, ca in the case of um, suicide bombing, we were presented with a kind of martyrdom where people use it to reclaim that thing that has been lost in an age of necropower, and that is control over their own death. Whereas with biopower, we lose control over our own life, where suddenly it is given over to medical institutions, it's given over to government policies and so on. With this necropolitical framework, we have been, and I say we, uh, you know, upper middle class or lower, lower middle class uh, white dudes like me don't really have to experience this, but people who have to experience the force of necro power have the capacity to command their own death or to factor their own death into their own lives. They do not have that capacity anymore. And in that way, suicide bombing as a form of martyrdom for Mbembe is a kind of act of resistance to those logics. And again, I think that it's important to stress that this isn't something that should be advocated for. And I don't think that Mbembe is doing that. I think that he is recognizing that it is a response to a form of control and power that is in itself reprehensible. And it can't be, you know, we can't discount that. We have to also consider these mechanisms that encourage these responses. So in, in conclusion, he says that Necropower opens up the possibility of certain death worlds, which isn't a good thing. It is the rendering of entire populations to a kind of suspended state of living, where death is almost always on the horizon. Never, they never know when it'll happen, but they know it'll be chosen by somebody else en masse. And so the logic of biopower, biopolitics, is essentially insufficient for Mbembe, and that there needs to be more of a consideration of the uh, use of death in galvanizing in um, forming power and demonstrating one's power and he concludes with the point that these new death worlds that emerge as a result they blur the line between resistance and suicide between sacrifice and redemption and between martyrdom and freedom where martyrdom is in itself a demonstration of freedom despite the fact that it is a killing of oneself or putting oneself to death it is um, a way to reclaim death that has been taken from people. And that's essentially what we have here with, with uh, necropolitics. I'd love to hear if anyone has anything to add or if there's anything I mischaracterized. I'd love to hear about it. Um, yeah, catch you next time. Take care.